We are generations deep on this land now. But when our great-grandfathers first made the journey across the ocean, the musket smoke from the land wars had barely settled. We arrived to a sparsely populated land where settler numbers had just overtaken the Tangata Whenua and the first generations of Aotearoa-born European were toying with the concept of New Zealander. And though we were invited, we were never welcome here. We were outsiders, competition in the quest for dominance. When our forefathers came to seek fortune in the place they named New Gold Mountain, it was with the dream of making their riches and returning to the villages they were raised in. But fate had other plans. Roots were laid down and homes were built. And so here we are, their descendants over 120 years later. In the very early days, this area was known as the Devil's Half Acre because it was lower socioeconomic parts of the community. There were houses of ill repute here, surrounded also by churches. I guess you could go from one to the other if you need to repent. <laughs> I was brought up in flat three, the top flat at the front. When I was growing up here, there was a stone wall at the back of the flats, and I'd climb up there and look wistfully over the fence and wonder what used to go on in this secluded, sort of grand old manor and 40 odd years down the track, I was elected president here. I was the first Chinese president here, so it was quite an honor, actually, considering that this was a gentleman's club. The women were only admitted as members in 1999. Fruiter's son to club president, I thought it was a sign of the times of how things have moved on. And it's only been 150 odd years that we've been here. And so it's remarkable, I think, that the Chinese have been accepted as part of Dunedin society. Like whispers of smoke from incense, ancient knowledge dances on our elders' breath, passed on from one generation to the next. My grandfather came over in 1920 to work and with the prospect of sending money back home. My father was born in China, so for the first early stages of his life, Dad didn't really know much about his father. He was about 18, but my grandfather sent him over to New Zealand to join him. This was my parents' wedding, Frank and Jesse, a very big Chinese wedding that they had at that time, so 1947. When mum got married to dad, mum's Chinese wasn't very good, so dad would only talk Chinese to my mother, so that way she would learn more of the language. I've come to see you, mum, because you've turned 100. What did you get from the queen when you turned 100? Nothing. <laughs> she gave you a card, signed by her. 
there was an arranged marriage, but uh, I'm told that when my father first saw my mother, he said, want to get married straight away, but my mother sort of said, no, let's wait a little minute. <laughs> Our history goes right back to 1882, when my great-grandfather came to New Zealand to earn some money to send back to family in China. It was towards the end of the gold rush period. Just the thought of gold was the impetus to get them here. Most of the Chinese that came, they actually intended to make their money and go back and live in style back in China and to actually die and be buried with their ancestors. But very sadly for most, it never happened. In the gold rush times, there were areas, I think, where some did smoke the opium. I guess it was the hard living, loneliness, their families were back in China, many reasons really. My grandfather's situation, he had seven children to support. He worked for a market garden in Timaru, and that's where he unfortunately started on the opium. During those years, my grandmother actually saved the family. She had sold all her possessions and was down to her wedding ring. She worked for a Chinese herbalist. They were given board and lodgings for the whole family. In 1881, when New Zealand was suffering a depression, New Zealanders were worried about the yellow peril coming and taking jobs from uh, New Zealanders. As a consequence of that, the poll tax was uh, instigated against the Chinese. It initially started at 10 pounds per person and then quickly rose to 100 pounds, equivalent to around about two years' salary, I guess, in modern times. It was a racist and discriminatory tax. There's no doubt about it. Obviously, it stymied the growth of the Chinese community in New Zealand, and it wasn't really until after World War II when Chinese families and women were allowed in the country that the Chinese community and population really started to take off. Around about 1940, my father was called up for the army service. From there, he joined the Scottish Regiment. Then, of course, my father, Bill Wong, became known as Bill Mac Wong. Because he was a Chinaman, they didn't quite know what to do with him because they didn't know where his allegiance would be. <laughs> even though, of course, he was prepared to fight for New Zealand. So he then decided he would try for the Royal New Zealand Air Force. That's the Young People's Club of the Era Club, Taranaki, Egmont, Patea, congratulating him for being New Zealand's first Chinese pilot officer serving in the RNZAF. This is um, a photo he took with his mates, so they've been friends of a lifetime. Looking back, it was a great way for us as a family later on to be able to assimilate into the community because he had the friendship of all the Kiwis. Pre-going into the army, the barbers wouldn't cut Chinamen's hair. My father's army mates took him back to the barber and there was no way the barber would not cut his hair. <laughs> so Dad actually helped Chinese community as a whole assimilate into the Kiwi communities.
One generation plants the trees and another gets the shade. Hard work is the foundation of our community. When our forefathers first crossed the ocean, the riches they sought were to create better lives for themselves and the family they left behind. This is the first uh, series of books commissioned on all the businesses that the Chinese were involved with. It's about the fruit shop industry. In Dunedin had a plethora of Chinese fruit shops. And this was the last of my family's fruit shops, four generations. So um, we've been here for quite a number of years now, serving the New Zealand economy one way or the other. Before we went to school, we would help bring out the fruit, make sure that that was looking good before we took off and walked to school. But after school, we would have to come back and be in charge of serving the shop. So we learned very early how to count because there were no such thing as computers. I think that's how we all got pretty good at uh, mathematics. One of the jobs would be to take off the paper wrappings around the fruit. In fact, we used that soft paper, we'd shake them to get the bugs out, and, you, and we used as toilet paper. <laughs> but let me tell you, all those people that did all those long hours working, they all made sure that the next generation didn't have to suffer and work as hard as what they did. When I married John, it wasn't considered the, the done thing. Cultures didn't intermingle. There was never any objection from John's family. My parents were not happy about it. This is a very early photo of John's parents, Joseph and Yi Day. It's the first four children in the family. This photo here, we assume that it was taken in China and it is of Yi Day. I would think it would be taken to send to Joe when he was choosing a wife. I always say we had to get married, but the reason we had to get married was we had bought a business. It was quite old and it had accommodation in it. There was no fire escape and I used to say it would never get out of this place if it burnt down. So John tied a huge rope around the leg of the bed and the idea was to throw that out the window and I would scale down the rope if we went on fire. No way was I going to do that, but yeah. That was one of his bright ideas. When I got married, I borrowed a thousand pounds off my sister in 1961. I don't think I paid it back, but <laughs> we got in the shop and just kept working, the wife and I, you know. And we start at six o'clock, we don't finish to nine o'clock at nights, and it was a six and a half days a week. Work for yourself is what you put in, is what you get out. So I can't read, I can't write, you know. I just see things, and I try it, and, and that usually works out all right. He had more bright ideas than you could think of. There was a glut of oranges, so him and a mate decided they'd brew up some orange beer. So they brewed it up and left it in our garage. Early one morning, there was one loud explosion. The beer blew up, and that was the end of the brewing business. Being young was basically working all the time. I can remember three holidays we went on in our entire life. When I was 15, my dad bought me a ute. How many 15-year-olds got a ute? 
but that was so I could get up real early in the morning and go to the market and then go to school. Then after school, have to go back and pick stuff up. So it wasn't like you got a free vehicle. You had no choice. You worked. That's the Chinese ethic. The standing joke is that everybody's brought up in a banana box in the back of the shop. Um, night shifts started, and they're just um, making up all the orders now to go out of town, to go on the trucks. So for most of the orders, they get through till 10 to midnight to put an order in, and then the truck leaves any time between 1 and 4 in the morning. The business name is called Khan's Catering Supplies. We wholesale food. We run six and a half days a week, 24 hours a day. We started from two containers and, a, and two vans, and then we've progressed to this new site, which is sort of our dream site. So this is um, vegetables that are already prepared, like rest homes will buy 100 pieces of pumpkin, because it might have 100 residents, and 100 bits of potato. Um, it's already prepared. It's already the right size they want it. They just buy it in and then cook it. We've got uh, special machines to do it all, so, yeah. When I started up this side of the business, all my friends were out going, doing things and all that. And I remember for probably the first three years, working seven days a week, 12-hour days. My dad liked to have his own businesses, but he never liked staff. Whereas, like I always says, I wanted to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and I just kept doing it. It's amazing, you know, what it is today. Mum and I started it, more or less, yeah, by working hard. We're very lucky, because if I didn't work hard, we wouldn't be here. You know, we'd be out there cleaning the street or something, wouldn't we? <laughs>
it took us over 10 years to raise the money for the garden. And we had raised $2.5 million, but also we had the New Zealand government donated $3.75 million. Peter Chin was the chair, and the cheque was presented by the Prime Minister, Helen Clark. He said that was the first time he cried in public receiving that cheque. And it happened to be on my birthday, so it was the best cheque I never got. There's a Chinese scholar from the Song Dynasty, Li Gu Fei, who said that the health of a city is judged by its gardens. And this garden wouldn't be an authentic Chinese garden without this rock. You need this particular rock, which comes from Lake Tai, the third largest freshwater lake in China. And this lake rock has been used in Chinese gardens and Chinese art form since the Tang Dynasty, 960 AD. And now you are not allowed to even take it out of the province of China. The Chinese have a whakatoki that says, if you make friends, you must be straight, but when you build a garden, it must be winding. So we have a zigzag bridge here. It serves two purposes. One, the evil spirits can only cross in a straight line. The other thing, of course, is that by making it zigzag, it gives that illusion of distance, so that it slows you down and makes you take your time in walking through the garden. I was able to delve and learn a bit more and connect back with my Chinese culture through this garden project. It made me proud to be Chinese. That was the first thing. Uh, it made me appreciate how hard my ancestors worked. When you're younger, nothing sort of uh, worries you and uh, you just carry on with life and you think yourself sort of um, uh, you know, bulletproof. But as you get older, you understand a bit more and want to know about where your roots, uh, where you come from. And our Chinese history is thousands of years old. Connecting back to that and understanding that is very important. What would our forefathers say if they could see us now? Would they be proud of the progress we have made? Would they see the benefit of the sacrifices they made all those decades ago? I first put this cookbook together because I wanted to show the home cooking through the generations since Chinese women settled in New Zealand. Popo is the Chinese name for grandmothers on the maternal side. In this book, I've used the endearing term of popo in respect of all the grandmothers. They have shared their recipes with me, and I have written up their stories. The love of cooking is their way of ensuring that the Chinese culture continues. The good thing that I've found now is that the Chinese before kept the Chinese for themselves, the Lebanese for themselves. But now with education, the children becoming a melting pot, including my granddaughter. She is half Nigerian and half Chinese, completely loved by all, and completely loved by my mother, who was so pro-Chinese. It was her grandchildren that educated her.
our history is a rich journey of many generations lived as Chinese New Zealanders. We are proud of where we come from and the sacrifices that were made to get us to this point. As we embrace the next part of our collective journey, we remember the brave journey of our forefathers across vast oceans to this unknown land. We honour them by continuing their quest for a good life as Kiwis, as Chinese, and we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand On Air.